The first inkling we had of the problem was in 1979. We didn't even have a map of the salt. That was very rapidly established with the aid of all the schools across Victoria. Here the students of Dimboola High School take their salt measuring devices into the local river for us in the middle of winter and they get a rude shock. There's a jiggle up and down and they're ready to take our first readings when they're steady. Well, it's actually surprising to see the salt that high. It's increased from a couple of months ago. Years ago it was just wasn't very salty at all and here you can if you get a mouthful you can really taste the salt. And I'm allergic to seawater. I come up with bumps and when I go swimming in here now, I come up with those bumps from just like seawater. So I can't go swimming in the river no more. Our data we're collecting today, along with schools from oh, roughly 500 or 600 schools around the state, all that data is being sent to the Rural Water Commission in Melbourne and they'll in turn collate all the data and send it back to the schools in the form of maps. Yeah, I'm just trying to wait for you that's actually salt. Well, that's three times as salty as seawater, that reading. Right. The channel water in this area isn't suitable for drinking. I mean, it's fine for animals, a farm stock to drink. But uh, the town supplies roughly about a thousand AC units, which is above sort of recommended health levels. That's right. Mm. Well, it's great that you're doing all that. And, that, and it's particularly good the students, I think, see it all and understand what's happening. So we know the intensity of salting, we know the extent of the problem, we know the rate of increase of salting in, the, in Australia and it's enormous. And we know the only thing to do is to lower the water table. And we know the only way to lower the water table is to reforest the catchments. And we have a lot of trials out that will tell us what trees we can use in what areas of the catchment. Trees are effectively non-mechanical pumps. They can pump the water table down and with it drops the salt but it's a matter of advancing from areas that are clean enough to hold trees to areas which are just beginning to salt. But we can't plant the trees and pump down the water table and continue the irrigation system and expect the trees to survive. So we've got to make some sort of choice between irrigation and survival, our survival. If you would like to see what these areas will look like in 10 years' time, we have to take it to Arizona, where in 1940 they irrigated cotton for the war effort. This is what you can do to a healthy desert. Once you've cleared it, mined it for cotton, salted it, abandoned it, and left it to blow away. This salt pan was a cotton field, irrigated cotton during the war. This was a mesquite tree, which were germinated about here somewhere, and this would all have been soil. The rate of soil formation here is very slow. It's a millimetre per thousand years, which is much slower than most areas. But it's dry and it's very flat, so that's understandable. The dust from the clay pan obliterated the roads and there were accidents. So uh, the Department of Roads and others drew small banks and sowed falling salt bush on them. What we see along here now is falling salt bush, but the mound is gone. It's blown away and it's also melted down, deflocculated because the soil is full of salt. However, it did stop the dust going across the highway. Beyond that, no attempt to rehabilitate the salt pan has been made, although it's possible to do so. The fact that the only rehabilitation we've attempted here is to protect the automobile says a lot about this society. We have the technologies to fix up and bring back into production a lot of eroded desert. We'll go and look at one of these techniques invented by Bob Dixon, an agricultural scientist. It's a great machine. <laughs> Good to see you. Good. I've come to have a look at your machine, see what you're doing here. Get some explanations. It's a curious thing, isn't it? Yes, it is uh, quite different. Uh, it's, uh, pitters are fairly common, but this uh, does make pits. We refer to it as a land imprinter. Please drive that rubber tie. Uh, yes, uh, these uh, angles are imprinting teeth. Uh, they uh, will make funnel-shaped depressions in the soil, which uh, will, in fact, funnel the rainwater and seed together so that you can take a little rainwater and get the seeds to germinate and to, to become established. 
people sometimes think that maybe it's, it'll make uh, rain. I don't claim that it's a rainmaker, but it's a rain stretcher. So this eight-pointed star it turns out to be the ideal configuration. The importance of this design is the fact that it takes uh, not nearly so much weight to, to push the angles into the soil. Well, once the soil is pitted and the wind blows, 86% of all seed ends up in the pits, and that's in nature. But as well as the seed, little bits of manure, like rabbit manure and sheep manure, they all roll into the pits. And uh, so whether I put it in the pit or not, it'll get there in the first wind. It'll, most of that will get into the bottom of the pit. And then when it rains, then these pits will infiltrate as much as 15 inches of wet soil. And round them, you'll only get infiltration of a very little water. So you can see that they're totally beneficial for kicking life back into the desert. So this is a stark contrast. Yeah, this is the way it looked before it was imprinted. Just, yeah, uh, you like that? It's essentially barren and, and where all the water either runs off the barren surface or, or evaporates. So 82 you imprinted. Just did, did you see it at the time or not? Uh, yes, this was um, this spectacular. Was well. When rain uh, occurs here, it uh, obviously sees nothing but the grass, and and so the soil surface uh, remains open and receptive to uh, to rainwater. You can see that if the water is not lost by surface evaporation and runoff, it can grow a tremendous amount of vegetation. Somebody once said that man has left a desert in his footprints wherever he's gone. Well, I think you can see that in this case, uh, we, we created a beautiful prairie in the, in the footprints of a land imprinter. We can use technologies to restore the present deserts to the original prairies that they once were. We can bring back the wonderful complex of animal species that once yielded so much from the prairies of North America and Africa. They were highly productive for protein and much more productive than the beef that succeeded them. And the beef, after all, were responsible for the deserts. If we can do that, and it is our duty, I think, to do it as stewards of Earth, then our grandchildren may be able to see something of the abundance that their great-grandparents encountered when they first came to those continents.